I'm John Ostrovsky, also known as Positive John. Uh, I feel confident sharing my angle of experimentation because I've seen different maturity levels of both sides of the force. You know, the marketing and the product. I ended up staying on the product side. And today I'm having a lot of fun with uh, iTech Media as principal for growth experiments. I'm part of this experimentation and analytics chapter, actively guiding and running experiments with one of our products, working with this chapter to standardize operations across product and delivery. And I'm also responsible for advocating the awesome work that we do inside and outside the company, just with chats like this one. I can't help but smile at you. That's <laughs> oh, cool. I'm going to ask you three questions. They're all three questions are focused on process. And, uh, you know, that's really where you're, you're geeking out on in terms of facilitating, but also evangelizing process and guardrails and things like that. Question number one, how do you prioritize things from a problem perspective? So how do you view getting an experiment launched from that strategic prioritization perspective? Not the solution, not the prioritization of the solution, but the strategic problem for an organization. And how are those mm -hmm. conversations processed uh, with you? Let me start with the way I see experimentation, right? I think it sets some important foundation. So I see experimentation as a framework for decision making. Cool. So now to the prioritization question. So on the problem level, uh, my view, it's basically that we're trying to decide, okay, what are we going to do next to grow this business? So we're already trying to right, make a decision. One of the mistakes that I see is understanding prioritization as a one step done and gone. And mm -hmm. it's where I see like methodologies like RICE and PXL being suggested for this high level prioritization which I don't feel like it applies. I really just don't love it. And I see then prioritization as different levels. So there are layers to it. And ideally in my programs, like the way I like to see experiments as a process, I have three levels that I always consider. And I'm going to be focusing on the first one that it basically touches what we're talking about here. In this first level, we're trying to prioritize the customer problem or this business metric that we're trying to improve, right? And ideally we will have this laundry list coming from both like things that we hear from the customers. So the voice of the customer, like a qualitative standpoint, but also things that we analyze from a top level metric. So the quantitative perspective that constitute this like laundry list. And then, okay, with this laundry list of customer problems to solve, how do we prioritize those? I like to keep in a very like strategic call considering like three dimensions. If we solve this problem, how much positive impact it generates in our growth model? Are we able to quantify that somehow? Cool. If we solve this problem, how much differentiation against the market we generate? Are we able to think in those terms? Perfect. The third and the one that has some of the times like the larger weight to it is, is there a natural order of operations to solving this problem? Let me give a very quick example. Sometimes you will need to solve the main navigation of your product before the new shiny feature that it's on the backlog, just because of order of operations, right? And this is then where I see that it sometimes it will have a, a larger weight to making a decision on, okay, what do we do next to grow this product? So in this strategic level, it's under those three dimensions and this laundry list coming from, okay, qualitative voice of customer, quantitative analysis of top level metrics that I see the discussion going. What do you think? Yeah, I think to, to put it tactically, you know, oh, by the way, like I give a little bit of credit to David Mannheim and, and putting out some languaging recently on top down prioritization that speaks uh -huh. to all of this. And a lot of people are engaging with that. I think that that's, that's where this question sort of originated and why I wanted to ask you about it. Tactically, there's a client that I work with, an uh, e-commerce client. They have the strategic goal of okay. a clean checkout experience, a clean and simplified, simplified checkout experience. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. So with that strategic goal in mind, that goal maps to a goal tree and maps to certain metrics that are more engagement, time on site, uh, page view. It's not so much to the conversion rate. And so the initiatives, the changes that you're introducing or the things you're taking away from the experience are not meant to increase a revenue metric, just not hurt a revenue metric, right? Mm -hmm. As you simplify and something like that. So that's where I saw, I saw a really healthy approach to, okay, this quarter, let's double down on this strategic goal. And what are the 18 solutions that we can put under that all map to our goal tree map in this particular way. And no one's expecting for us to hit home runs on the conversion rate side or the, mm -hmm. the revenue side. 
let's just not hurt things as we do as we push on this. There are two things that I want to echo from what you're suggesting. I feel like the first one is the time horizon of selecting the problem to solve. You just mentioned like the quarter, mm. Amazon would do this like in a year perspective, right? Uh -huh. So this time frame is also very important when we're in this level, just having this very clear to all parts. My second level of prioritization is exactly what you mentioned. Like what are the many different solutions? So it's a solution prioritization. What are the many solutions that we can solve this one problem that we already defined is going to be the theme of our next quarter. And then you get into the solution prioritization. The third level, the more tactical, where instead of thinking vertically, you're now thinking horizontally. Okay, for this problem that we're solving, for the solution that we have a lot of evidence is the good way to go. How are the many different ways that this can look like? This is when you're in the more like tactical, you're yeah. talking in terms of testing hypothesis. And this is where I see PXL as a good methodology for you to start introducing and thinking in those terms. Yeah, you know, there's, there's three levels here. And mm -hmm. my question number two, what language and, lang language and frameworks are you seeing success in evangelizing mm -hmm. and enrolling people into this experimentation mindset and advancing the culture? This is a very good topic because it's very fresh for something we've been working a lot in iTech refreshing what we call the operational framework for experimentation, all right? So one of the quotes that I have from this discovery period even, so one of the biggest barriers to velocity is culture. And one of the main commonalities in a culture is a shared language that facilitates transmission of information. So we started a little bit from that pillar. And today, experimentation at iTech means product initiatives, safety net, CRO, those being the three active workflows, active streams of work and research and advocacy. Those are the passive workflows that are always happening mm. in any given point of time. How did this help us? First, it's our way to clarify people's needs to our leadership and help grow our products. Let me try to be specific here. If a product a product manager decides that CRO as a workflow should be part of their strategy, they need to be able to explain a certain people, um, you know, focus and, and time effort dedicated to this more fast paced environment of, of always be testing. So if this is not there, we just don't consider CRO as an active workflow and expectation is set up the chain of command, already expecting less number of or quantity of tests. So this is how it helped us clarifying people needs and setting expectations up and down the chain of command. The second and the one I like the most is that I, I like to think that we're mostly demystifying the misuse of CRO, right? I never really liked that term, you know, thrown out there. Mm -hmm. And because I see that we're defining what experimentation as an umbrella term exactly means for a company like ours. And here, I just think it's very important to emphasize for a company like ours, doesn't mean that translating this to other environment will just work. We believe in the power of calling things by their right names, you know, having this consistency. One of the things that it's usually in our conversations, yeah, consistency is one of the influence powers, right? So we believe in the consistency of message as something that it's important to us. So this is how like the naming conventions came to play as a way, okay, we were refreshing the way of how experimentation works in an operation aspect, naming conventions being one of the pillars for us to communicate and clarify set expectations across stakeholders and whatnot. And do you maintain a kind of a sub question here? Do you maintain like a knowledge mm -hmm. base to, to facilitate the, the consistency? Yeah, both a wiki to facilitate the, uh, you know, the conventions. And there's also like, we would like to say that we go on a tour explaining and clarifying that methodology, that naming convention to product managers and delivery. It's, it's, it's basically like our you know biggest focus, but we also have like this database that we control, okay, for the, all the products, what are the streams of work that they have active? Because then this is what clear, like clarifies and sets the expectation. Okay, this product here is just running safety nets and uh, product initiative. So CRO already expect less quantity of uh, experiments. Ah, but why is that? Uh, then it's a conversation between uh, product management and business analysts. 
right? It's interesting that you, and if I heard you right, you're, the organization has like these active work categories and a couple of the passive ones and the active ones, you mentioned one was safety net, one was CRO, I think. CRO and product initiatives, the three product active initiative. streams. And that's interesting. There's two other organizations I, I know of right now that are breaking up all the silos in the departments and, 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 uh -huh. and having these functional work streams. Uh -huh. One, for example, uses um, the categories of optimization, keeping the lights on and strategic growth. It's somehow similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some there's some commonality. And what they do is they'll create squad, you know, the squads will be from marketing, from engineering, whatever. And then they'll a project they're working on will be under the umbrella of one of those three. So they know what they're what they're doing. They'll have the context. What's the focus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so speaking of the team structure stuff, my third question, how do you see program structure? Center of excellence, mm -hmm. hub and spoke, the squads. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned in some of this stuff before, like decentralization of what you're mm -hmm. doing and advocacy. To me, that sounds like the center of excellence creating the guardrails, the language, the commonalities, mm -hmm. enabling other teams to do what they mm -hmm. do. So speak to that. I would maybe like to understand, like, what do you understand as a center of excellence? Because maybe we could together reach a better conclusion here. So my center of excellence is, is you're, you're not actually facilitating or doing the, the testing for another group, but you're providing the language and mm -hmm. language in terms of maybe even the tool set, but generally these guardrails for how to think and how to act and, 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 and do that. So you're, you're enrolling and enabling, uh, but you're mm -hmm. not executing in a lot, of, a lot of ways. Sometimes you are, sometimes you are the executor um, if the organization is small, but if you've got a lot of units testing, you're just that facilitator and so you're you're creating that that common cultural flavor of how, of how how to do things. Yeah, I feel like you hit the keyword and a similar conclusion that we've done during our discoveries. I would say that the center of excellence is part of the vision, but like mm. if we want to be very purists on the center of excellence by its definition, it's like it's this entity that provides like leadership, best practices, support, training to mm -hmm. other business units, but doesn't execute the keyword you used as well. And because we hold this operational characteristic, I wouldn't call us a center of excellence today. As an organization structure, we're like uh, this chapter, right? So the experimentation chapter, and this comes from this Spotify model, which you will read from a lot of people who love it, who hate it. I mm. personally like it because I feel like it solves uh, particular problems like think we have conversion specialists in the squad level in operations so the chapter is basically you know bringing those specialists together to provide the knowledge sharing the standardization of work just as we talked about the framework it standardizes operations in that level it doesn't avoid but at least attempts to minimize silos in the knowledge sharing right and another characteristic that I see, so apart from, okay, standardization, providing the best practices, as we mentioned, is that the chapter under this Spotify mythology will also um, sponsor, sponsor those show and tells or uh, open calls for other chapters to uh, foster this cross-pollination of knowledge across the business. So in a way that we go in a tour, presenting the experimentation framework for content, for delivery, for product, and this go full circle because they will also um, have the same tours for our chapter. And this cross-pollination happens in a better way to distribute knowledge. So in this regard, I like how the chapter structures solves that problem. Uh, but I also mm -hmm. understand the problems of the sometimes things that you read, the attempts to over-label things that a squad must have an engineering entity, a delivery and a product manager. Otherwise it can function as a squad. Well, what if I have this great idea that it's innovation and we want to outsource most of the operations. So we're going to fix ourselves because it doesn't follow the mythology. This is something that you would read from the other side of the coin. But again, from my perspective, under this experience that I have, for the experimentation right now, under the vision of becoming a center of excellence, works pretty well. When these rules hit up against a principle that is at a higher level of order of consideration, then then that's when you break it and you you make it you make an exception. You update your process. You update your principle. You update the thing. I like what you add there. You know this idea of know the rules uh, well enough so you're able to break them with perfection. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they are made to be broken, but you have to have be logical. And when you break, you have to have a higher principle reason to break them.